Good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to this, uh, this uh, second day of the, uh, the conference uh, here in uh, Nor Shipping. Um, the issue of uh, global governance, as uh, we've been hearing, is uh, clearly very important to all of us here. But shipping remains a business. Individual shipping companies have their own agendas. And operating successfully in this changing landscape does require new thinking. Uh, in this session, uh, we hope to learn more about the emerging opportunities in the, uh, the whole ocean space, not just in the, uh, the cargo shipping business. But first, uh, we'll hear from several representatives of two shipping segments that have been perhaps hardest hit in the last uh, five or eight years, dry bulk and offshore, and the lessons that they perhaps can see from uh, the experiences that they've had. So I'd like to welcome to the stage our panelists, Khalik Hashim from Pressure Shipping, Herman Billing from Songa, and Njal Sevik from Havila. Gentlemen. Thank you, uh, thank you, gentlemen. As I said, the, uh, the depth of the, uh, the severity of the, uh, the crisis has, uh, has hurt everyone and uh, some people are actually, in fact, no longer, no longer with us in the, uh, the corporate sense. We hope to have a, a frank conversation here about what went wrong and uh, what might change in the uh, future. Perhaps um, uh, we could just uh, turn to the dry bulk uh, business uh, for, for starters, uh, perhaps closest to, uh, to, uh, to my heart, certainly, and uh, Herman and uh, Khalid. Uh, you've both many decades of experience in, uh, in the business, uh, but this perhaps has been a perfect storm over the last uh, five or eight years. What made this downturn different and what key lessons do you feel you and the industry has learnt for the coming decade ahead? Herman, could I ask you first? I think um, we have to take a step back, long step back, back to say 2004, the start of the super cycle, which was driven by strong de demand growth from the steel sector in China. And for the first time, I think, you had a utilization of the dry bulk fleet close to 100% up to 2008, and uh, leading up to Lehman Brothers. During those years, you had suddenly, there was not enough capacity, but you had huge buildup of, of uh, shipbuilding capacity, in, particularly in China. Yards were popping up all over the place along Yangtze River and in the north. And uh, in the heyday, say 2007 and 8, uh, and we all know that uh, banks are not typically counter-cyclical, so uh, financing was easy available, high leverage, low margins, and in combination with a lot of shipyard capacity, that led uh, and uh, ended with a big bang in November 2008, Lehman Brothers. Uh, that kind of led to the kind of first collapse. Then, a couple of years later, it, uh, with all this capacity, you had a small recovery, I would say, 2011 and 12, and then uh, a lot of vessels were delivered, 14 and 15, vessels that the market really didn't need. And in 15, at the same time, that coincided with the first year, many, in, I would say, in decades, with a negative demand growth. Mm. 70 million tons of uh, coal kind of disappeared uh, or, uh, fr fr from the Chinese import. So, so you had, and then in Q1, 16, we all believed that the dry bulk market was structurally damaged and it will take a long, long time to repair it. I remember in the summer of 2008, uh, one of the leading, uh, head of the, one of the leading ship broker companies said in an interview that this is the best dry shipping uh, uh, market we have seen since the Viking Age. And uh, I would say that Q1 2016 was the worst market we have ever seen or since in the Viking Age. So it was a perfect storm and a collapse. But if so many people were wrong, if the market was wrong in so many ways, how does that affect your thinking as a specific business today? Has it changed your thinking? I would say that uh, ship owners are notorious, famous for a short memory. Um, I, I think are there, are there other things which I believe uh, will influence it. Um, financing right now is definitely not easy available. 
There is a consolidation in the ship, uh, shipping building industry. A lot of bankruptcies, in particular in China, which I think will be extremely helpful. Uh, so, so but the problem is that when second-hand values, which kind of correlates 95% with, with the time charter earnings, when as, five asset values on second-hand values goes up, owners will look for better investment opportunities. And they, again, they will turn uh, to the art, but it will not be this, uh, as easy this time around. Indeed. I hope to return to the market right this uh, today in a moment. I think uh, the, most, the most important, what, what we see right now, is that there is absolutely no ordering. And, uh, and I think uh, that's the most Im cheerful moment I have every morning when I read the emails, is that there is no orders being placed. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Khalid, you are known as having a more conservative strategy. You have had a more conservative strategy. However, your ships are trading in the same freight markets. You suffer the same low rates. What lessons have you taken away from the last decade? Well, firstly, uh, you know, like uh, a very famous uh, personality uh, said about uh, new building ordering. He said that uh, new building ordering is not a team sport. It's an individual event. So if I order ships before you, then I'm ahead of the game, and I really don't care what happens after that. Yeah. Now, the problem with shipping is that all of us play what is known as the zero-sum game. So if somebody else is winning, that means I'm losing. So when you see somebody else trying to take a leapfrog step ahead of you, you try and emulate that almost instantaneously. So what happens is that you suddenly find that uh, you know, like Herman is saying that uh, you get up in the morning today, read the papers, nobody's ordering ships, and you're so happy. And then one morning you wake up and you find out that, well, everybody has been ordering ships, and now you have a huge buildup of ships. Just to give you some statistics, in 2007, as an example, just in that one year alone, 169.19 million deadweight tons of dry bulk ships was ordered. And this is only in the 10,000 uh, uh, and upward uh, uh, sector. That was, at that time, 45% of the existing fleet. And if you think that was not bad enough, you have four, three more years in which owners ordered more than 100 million tons. Uh, 2008, 104.12 million tons. 2010, 104.46 million tons. And 2013, 104.12 million tons. And then we say we have a problem. The problem is us. And I don't think this is going to change. Uh, what Herman has not mentioned, and which uh, you could look up by Googling, uh, look up any time in history, and you will always find the same statement. Stupid owners, stupid shipyards, stupid bankers, all put together create the perfect storm. And I don't think this is going to really change. <laughs> very, <laughs> very well put. And actually, a, a, very, a very powerful statistic uh, that I've seen is that the, the dry bulk fleet is uh, today 50% bigger, 48%, I think, specifically, than it was at the start of 2009. The global car carrying capacity, which explains a great deal. Now, five years ago, I'm sure you in the offshore business would have been looking at the dry bulk business and thinking, well, the silly, uh, silly so-and-sos that, uh, you know, how can they have got themselves into such, uh, such, a, uh, such a position? However, the offshore business did, has suffered its own perfect storm. Uh, what are the lessons uh, that you take away from the, uh, the perfect storm in the, uh, in the offshore business? Uh, it's probably a little bit the same. Um, growth story, 10 years of continuous growth, oil price high, a uh, lot of new rigs which need two vessels, four vessels, depend on which area they go. And you built a growth story, brokers, bankers, owners, and you just build too many vessels. You get the oil price falling, uh, demand falling, uh, corruption scandal in the Petrobras, and all these things coming on the top of each other and make the perfect storm and make the worst downturn ever in the offshore industry. And um, demand now bottom out, but uh, the supply side is just too high. Could I ask uh, the parallels with the dry bulk business and other parts of shipping? Was the offshore business seduced by the allure of new technology, high tech, shiny new ships, and then e cheap and easy money at the same time? And how do you stop individual uh, owners? How do they restrain themselves from being uh, seduced in that, that fashion? 
I think offshore moving to deep water was technology driven. Mm -hmm. And of course, especially in Norway, that's been our advantage. Yep. But at the same time, or disadvantage at the moment, because we have the most expensive vessels, we have the most advanced vessels, and um, the demand for that is also suffering higher. And uh, on the other hand, that's also an advantage because you know that it's fewer owners in that segment than in the total market. But uh, like uh, the, it is at the moment, that's the biggest challenge. We're very pressed for time this morning, so but before we come back to the offshore bit, the, the, the dry bulk bar market today, could I just ask you, in the, uh, your perception of the, uh, the offshore uh, business, offshore vessel business, today you have a lot of companies that are being restructured. However, they remain very, uh, very heavily indebted, mostly. The market is still very weak. Uh, how do you see this business uh, surviving the next two or three years? Do you anticipate there will have to be another round of restructurings? Do you, be, do you believe there will be a way to uh, overcome that, uh, that problem? Most of the restructuring done is based that the market is coming back and increased. I think... Is that realistic? The market would come back and it would come back uh, up to heights, but it never go, gonna come back, I think, of the heights we see in 12 and 13, which was a booming market at the end of a real big cycle. So the market would come back, but not back to what we have seen. In a nutshell, will some of the laid up ships ever see business again? Some of the laid up ships would never come back to the business in offshore. Would you put a number on that? How many? No, okay. but there are 300 PSVs listed as under construction or finished construction in China, yeah. most of them would not come to the market, but if that's going to be 25 or 50, I don't know. Okay, thank you for that. Very quickly on the dry bulk business, we've seen a, a flurry in uh, second-hand uh, prices in the last uh, six months, up, up to 50% in some, uh, some sectors. Herman and Songa, you've made a very interesting play. You have 10 vessels already, you've inspected many more. Freight rates drove that to some extent, they've now fallen back. Yesterday, the Baltic Dry Index was down at 900 again. Uh, has this mini boom gone bust before it's even started? I think it's perfect. Um, because the order book is shrinking every day. Yep. And, and if we just get through another six months, uh, we have twice as many vessels older than 20 years that, that are on order. And I think this, and also new regulations, which has to do with sustainability, uh, low sulfur, balanced water treatment su system will support scrapping. So I think combination of a weaker market and new regulation is very helpful. If we came back in two years, how, will, how big will Songa bulk be? Uh, we will not be uh, extremely big, maybe 15, 18 vessels or something like that. Okay, thank you for that. Khalid, your yeah. perspective. Uh, you know, I can just uh, elaborate some more statistics on the on what uh, Herman has touched upon, the regulatory environment. I think ship owners are basically irresponsible. They will never scrap enough ships unless they're forced to. And this is where the regulation comes in. If you look at the ballast water management uh, system, as of the, which, uh, which is law from 8th of September uh, this year, at the start of quarter two, that is on the 1st of April, we had 115.51 million deadweight tons of ships that were greater than 15 years of age. Now, it means that sometime during the next two or three years' time, or next year onwards, they will have to fit in, uh, retrofit these ballast water management uh, systems. And I can assure you that the size of the equipment that is required, and we have it on our new buildings, uh, is so huge that none of these older ships have engine room spaces that can accommodate this change. So this is the first uh, big issue. Second issue, of course, is the cost. Uh, then you come to the maximum 0.5% sulfur uh, oil coming into law, uh, burning of that coming into law or, uh, by the 1st of January 2020. If by some magic none of these 115.51 million deadweight tons of ships get scrapped uh, during the next two, three years' time, then on the 1st of January 2020, uh, this number would have risen to 160 million deadweight tons. Okay, now these will be ships greater than 15 years of age. Now, the problem with burning clean oil is that all these ship engines are designed to burn really dirty crap. Now, you can't take a Lamborghini and put diesel oil into it and expect the, ship, uh, the, the, the car to run. Similarly, if you take a very 
old designed engine, which is designed to run on very dirty, crappy oil, and you start to put clean oil into it, the ship will break down. So these ships will have a big issue ahead of them. They will have to think of fitting scrubbers. Now, scrubber technology, first of all, is only lab tested, so we don't know whether it works. Two, we don't know whether the lab tests are verified correctly or not, and we know about the famous Volkswagen cheating on emissions. Then you've got, uh, uh, on the scrubbers, you've got uh, lab tests, but you don't know in reality. Now, we've just got news of a ship which trades only in Mexico and US Gulf, so needs this scrubber system being retrofitted today in China. And we were horrified to learn, first of all, that the cost just for the main engine, not for the auxiliary engines, is more than three and a half million dollars. And that it will take four months to retrofit. And in a first class, Chinese yard, which doesn't have too much business, as Herman has already said, and has so many people to throw at this project. Still, minimum four months' time. So I think that these two regulations, one way or the other, they're going to remove the supply, not because we're responsible, but because we'll be forced to. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your contributions. Very pithy, very to the point, and uh, most informative. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.